Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Elisa Prideri, as she will highlight a complete beginner's guide to 3D printing. At any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll get back to you via email within two business days. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Form Labs. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Prideri. Well, thank you so much, Adam, uh, for the introduction and also uh, Henry Schein Dental. It is an honor for me to be presenting uh, this webinar today about 3D printing, a complete beginner's guide featuring a product demo. Uh, it is a very exciting topic because for all of uh, professionals that are connecting today, it is actually a topic that in my experience, I had a, like plenty of conversations and I detected one thing is that uh, some, a lot of professionals don't know how to start. So uh, this webinar, my intention is also to give you uh, sort of my learnings and uh, what are the stra best strategies to get you started with this fascinating technology that is not only going to enhance our practice, but mostly would provide a great benefit to our patients. Uh, as Adam introduced me, I'm Dr. Elisa Praderi. A little bit about myself. Uh, I am a trained dentist uh, from Uruguay uh, with experience in research and in private practice, both in uh, let's say uh, joint practice, but also in emergency service at the university where I attended. I am um, the clinical protocols and QAP leader manager at Form Labs. So I am working for, for Form Labs and I'm also part of the editorial board of a 3D printing magazine. And I'm also an internal student. Uh, and so I'm undergoing also postgraduate mastership in aesthetic dentistry. So um, I have learned a lot about, about this technology and probably as a lot of people that are connecting today, uh, in order to learn about this technology, uh, you should look this uh, content yourself. Probably you were not instructed uh, under formal dental education. And uh, I just wanted to communicate that 3D printing can be overwhelming, but it's much easier than we think. It's just making the right uh, decisions and taking the right steps to make this a fun process, actually, that will uh, have a great impact uh, in, our, in our, let's say, in our professional life. So. A little bit about the topics today or what is the agenda. We're going to be starting with an introduction to 3D printing for the dental practice. We're going to be talking about benefits and applications of 3D printing uh, in the office, plus an understanding about additive manufacturing and SLA technology, explaining the most, let's say, um, digestible way possible to make it uh, as understandable uh, for everyone. Uh, also, some best practices of how to implement the workflow, how to set up your space, and some practice management tips. So without any further delay, let's get started. And the first question, which probably some of you can already answer, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of a context of 3D printing for the dental practice. And let's start with why. Why shall we adopt technology and 3D printing? But again, 3D printing, it's, uh, it's part of a bigger workflow. And I always like to revisit a little bit when we talk about going digital, we first need to get to back to the essence of what is our today our standard workflow in our practice? What is the traditional versus the digital workflow? So I always like to uh, share this sort of um, a very useful uh, uh, diagram that compares traditional and digital workflow where we identify some key points. First is that the digital workflow, it's evident that the amount of steps that you need to do a standard procedure are much less compared to the traditional workflow. And that this means that less steps, we will be adding less amount of error. And also it would change completely the way that we're scheduling our appointments. So uh, the traditional versus digital workflow, it is evident the differences. I think we are all starting to get more and more familiarized with this. Uh, but it really changes not only like how fast we can deliver a treatment, but also how we're going to structure all our time for specific treatments. So we need to um, acknowledge what are the main differences between the traditional and the digital workflow. Uh, and this can it varies for everything. So bearing this in mind, it's important to understand the following. OK, now looking a little bit more into detail to the digital dentistry workflow. If we, let's say, fragment the different steps that we can be, uh, let's say, looking at when we are going to be doing a specific dental procedure, uh, in the digital workflow, uh, I always like to start by this because printing and 3D printing, as we're going to see into detail, is the third step of the workflow. 
so when we're talking about uh, 3D printing, it's important that we see the bigger picture, that it's part of a bigger, uh, let's say, uh, workflow that we need to understand. So we know that we're going to have a scanning stage where we're going to digitize our case. We're going to do plan and design as the second one. We're going to 3D print per se, and then we're going to deliver a treatment or, for example, our, our appliance that we fabricated for a patient. So I always like to stress the fact that uh, let's not underestimate what happens before, because if we look at scanning, we know that we can have like two processes. For example, whether we digitize our case uh, directly with the internal scanner or we take an impression and we're going to be using a desktop scanner. So regardless of the process that we're going to be using, it is very important that, for example, for internal scanning protocol, that we follow the right steps as per manufacturer's instructions and guidance, because what we register with a scanner and what our digital patient is going to be looking at is going to be the framework for whatever appliance we design afterwards. And the printer is only going to replicate whatever we sort of register in the uh, via internal scanning. The same well happens to the dental lab. They need to have a, a high quality scan. So we know that whatever, if we send a PBS impression that they can sort of digitize their case uh, accordingly. As for the next step about planning and design, there are different softwares available depending on application. And this is usually where people get overwhelmed uh, or like, shall I adopt the software uh, stages in-house or not? So there are a lot of different uh, softwares out there that you're free to decide whether you want to adopt to take it in-house or whether to outsource. So a little bit about, uh, there are a lot of, mo for example, software available depending on your application, just to give you a very big screenshot of options for model production, or even for aligners and retainers, there's like a huge amount of softwares out there and design services or paper case uh, type of, uh, let's say, uh, softwares that you can use. And this is, uh, let's say, uh, a part where I always stress that you don't need to use all of these, like, let's say, adopt software in-house to be start printing. Uh, you can sort of decide what you want to do, combine it the best way possible in order to benefit from, for example, if you have a scanner, Maybe you want to outsource the design, that's fine, but then you can print it in-house. But if you start to feel more confident and you want to do the design yourself, then that's wonderful. You can continue to do so. But again, it's not, uh, I always try to say like, although we see all this picture, it's not necessary that we adopt all these steps. So uh, software, it's a very big area. And uh, again, it's depending on your needs and, and your learning curve that you need to decide what to take in-house and what to outsource. So the next step will be printing per se. So, if whatever we did before was not followed thoroughly, of course, we're going to be dragging that error towards the printing stage. So it's very important to acknowledge the importance of scanning, a good design, and then printing. And for printing, uh, and this is part of the webinar, I wanted to show you because uh, people say, what do I need to do with a printer? How do I print? And to, today I wanted to show as part of this webinar how easy it is to prepare um, the, a printer, for example, the Formlabs printer, the Form 3B, uh, in order to print a model. So um, what I'm going to be doing, I'm still showing that live in a second, but you're going to see that when you decide to 3D print, you need to acknowledge that there are different steps that you need to consider within the, let's say, 3D printing workflow. On a first stage, you need to decide what not, not only the printer, of course, that you're going to be using for printing, but also what materials do I have available for printing in this ecosystem? So depending on the application, you need to decide what resin you're going to be using. Is it going to be an, a, an appliance, an end-use appliance that I want to print, for example, in direct bonding trays? Maybe I need a material that it's going to allow me to print the tray uh, that it's uh, with a biocompatible resin, register for its own purpose that I can use later to, uh, let's say, uh, do uh, indirect bonding of brackets in my patient's mouth. Or if I want to print a model, I need a model uh, resin that's going to replicate exactly the anatomy that I want. But of course, for example, it's going to be very different whether I need a model to do a thermoformed appliance compared to a model that's going to be a restorative model where maybe I want, I need super, super high accuracy and I need to sort of test the fit of a bridge or a crown. So the requirements even for models are going to be different. And depending on how, um, what are your necessities and specific treatments, there are different options available. So always the first steps starts with how to uh, choose, uh, like let's say choosing that material right. So for the next step, 
Once you have, for example, exported from your CAD software a specific, your specific design, uh, you need to prepare it to print. And this is super important because uh, you need to give it a specific orientation. The orientation is going to affect printing time, as we're going to be seeing in a second. And, uh, but it's very important that you follow this process to orient the part accordingly, uh, to add the support structures if needed, in order to you, for you to, let's say, um, uh, print your case. So this is very important to acknowledge because people say, how do I print? You need this bridge of a software in order to send the, what your design to the printer. And in this case, we're going to be seeing preform. As for the next step, we're going to have uh, the printing, printing per, per se, which is actually the easiest thing to do, as we're going to be seeing in a moment. What you need to do in the printing stage is basically setting up the printer with three elements in order for it to get started. Once the part is printed, and I always get this question, and there is a like a, sometimes you need to clarify, once the part is printed, it's not ready just out of the printer. What you need to do afterwards is to wash the part uh, in IPA, a 90% concentration or higher, and then you need to cure the part. Why is this important and why is this relevant? It's because we need to wash away the excess liquid resin that's going to be co uh, covering our object. So uh, it's very important to do a washing stage uh, in order to remove that resin, and then we need to allow it to dry and then finally cure it. Curing is very important because once we remove the part from the printer, it's in what we call the green state and it's, uh, the material still needs to undergo a further curing to allow it to achieve its final mechanical properties and biocompatibility for those resins that are biocompatible. So now without further delay, let's look at what the printing stage looks like. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to be changing scenes and now what I always like to share is that it's super important when you are working with 3D printing and of course we are sort of used to this is that always wear gloves so for this case uh, I'm going to be uh, putting myself the gloves again it's super important that this is not a, like to communicate to the dental team also this best practices so now that we have the gloves on, we can sort of prepare the printer. And first thing to note is that the printer, for example, the, this is a Form 3B by Form Labs. Uh, as you see, it has this orange cover and the elements that are going to help me to print the, in this printer are going inside the printer. So what do you need to print? Basically, when you are dealing with 3D printing, you, you need three basic elements. One, it's the resin tank that the resin tank in this case comes in a plastic box. As you see, it has a, 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 this orange cover also that will, uh, let's say, protect my liquid resin from curing. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to remove the lid and this, and this actually contains my, what we call the resin tank. And this resin tank, for example, already has the liquid resin. One question that I get a lot is, for example, uh, after I finish printing, shall I, uh, let's say, uh, empty the tray uh, or what do I do? It's not necessary. The idea of 3D printing is actually to make it very versatile and very easy to shift between materials. And when you have a resin tank, it's, uh, you can uh, just remove it from the printer and store it while you're not using it and then change it for another, let's say, new resin tank with another resin. So it's very easy to shift between materials. So what you do next is once you have your resin tank, you're just placing it in the printer. And here the printer, in the, it has a printer screen. It, it tells you automatically that, okay, this resin tank was detected. And uh, this is very nice to see, for example, that the, the, the printer recognizes that all the elements are in place. So for example, now it it's, has a resin tank. But the next element, the element number two that you need is always you need a build platform. So what is the build platform? A build platform is, uh, let's say, as the name says, it's a platform where our object is going to be constructed. So uh, this object is going to be, uh, in this case, I'm printing a model that's going to have its base directly on this build platform. The reason why I decided to do that is because uh, for it's going to print the fastest because what affects the time in, let's say, in printing? It's going to be the Z-axis. So if I have a flat object, 
I'm going to be printing this height. But if I orient an object vertically, it's going to have to print a much, let's say, um, a taller height. And that is going to affect my print time. And in this case, uh, printing models directly on the build platform, it's a very good balance, uh, let's say, for having a fast model that it's going to be super accurate. So this platform is fundamental. A lot of 3D printers have it. So what we are ne need to do next is going to place a build platform in the printer and it has a handle that will secure the platform. So we will see this in a second, but how the printing is going to happen is this platform is going to descend to the resin tank to where the liquid resin it is. And there's going to be a laser from the bottom curing our element layer by layer. So you will go, you're going to see that the build platform is going to lower and it's going to be printing the object in what we call upside down. So it's going to have an inverted orientation. So once we have the resin tank and we have the build platform, we need just one final element, which is the resin cartridge. So the resin cartridges, uh, what is important in, let's say, VAT polymerization and the family, uh, let's say, of 3D printing, and we're going to be seeing this, uh, let's say, analysis in a second, is that the resins come in a liquid state. And in this case, it comes in, in this uh, container. This is, I'm going to be using a resin that's called Draft Resin V2. And why I'm going to use this material is because it's going to be printing uh, very fast and it's ideal for, for example, model production that I want to use for thermoforming or like producing bleaching trays or retainers on a same day appointment. So it's going to be a super nice material and we're going to be printing live with this, um, with this resin. So, what you need to do to place it in the printer is I'm going to remove this orange cap that is, is protecting the valve. And why is this important in protecting the valve? It's because this particular printer, what it does, it's it dispenses automatically liquid resin to the resin tank. A lot of other printers, what they do is that you need to, the user manually has to dispense the resin. Of course, the, the reason what can happen here is there's always risk of, for example, over, let's say, over you know, putting uh, excess resin in the resin tank, or for example, uh, having some resin spills. So the, what is super nice of the printer in this case is that it allows you to just press print and the printer will automatically dispense the resin that's needed for the print job. So although we have resin here, it's super important that the cartridge with liquid resin, it's let's say, present in the printer. So what I will do, it's also open the ventilation cap because this will allow the entrance of oxygen there to the resin cartridge, and it's going to be helping dispense automatically the liquid resin. So what I do is I'm going to place it in the back of the printer. And here also the, the printer screen tells me, okay, you inserted a draft B2 cartridge. Why is this important or why is this super nice feature to have? Because if you are, for example, let's say printing with the, a lot of materials and you confuse the cartridge with the tank, the printer won't allow you to print because it would tell you the tank does not match the cartridge. And sometimes it can seem obvious when you're printing with, for example, biocompatible resins with not biocompatible, but if you, for every reason, start to print, for example, permanent or temporary restorations or with tooth colored uh, resins, uh, actually having more than one Vita shade can actually, uh, you can mix up much more easily than compared to other materials. And in this case, having the printer that identifies that your shade matches the same of the tank with a cartridge, is super important. So once we have everything set up for the printer side, we have the tank, the build platform, and the cartridge in the back of the printer, the printer is ready to print. So what I did before is actually I use that software bridge that I was talking before that it's called Preform in order to send my model to the printer. So uh, and we're going to be seeing that software also with another feature uh, that's super nice to base models. But what that software does is that via Wi-Fi, I send it to the printer and in the printer screen, I can see my print job. So here it tells me, okay, I have this print job up next. It tells me how much it will take to print. It would sell me the resin and also the layer height resolution that I chose. So once I see that everything's fine, I'll just go into press print and press next because the printer guides you through different steps to let you know that uh, the build platform 
cartridge and tank are all in place. And once that it's done, the printer will start doing its job. So it will fill the resin tank, it will uh, start then uh, the print job for itself. And once it's done, the platform will elevate with the printed object ready for the next steps, which is going to be washing and curing. So now that we saw how it's going to, uh, let's say, setting up the printer, throughout this webinar, we're going to be seeing uh, the other part of the presentation. And uh, towards the end, we're going to be seeing what is the printed result. So now coming back to the presentation. So I'm going to be sharing my screen again. So I hope that was a comprehensible, let's say, walkthrough of how to set up a printer. And now coming back next to the presentation. Okay. So the next step would be after we have our printed element that we're going to be, let's say, removed from the printer and we do what we call the post-processing and we wash it and cure it, for example. We have, for, for in this case, uh, our model ready to be used for thermoforming. So uh, we're ready to use that model to deliver our end use appliance. And this is actually a very nice uh, example of uh, you don't need to change your, let's say, uh, protocol in, in producing this, let's say, bleaching trays or retainers. The materials today of resins, you don't, in this specific case with Graphi2, you don't need to add any sort of, let's say, separating agent. You just can continue doing your standard workflow. So a little bit about the digital dentistry workflow, and I sort of referred this before. Again, just to state is that you can decide what you want to bring in-house and what to outsource. There are different combinations possible. Of course, you can do as a first step, for example, having all the workflow in-house. So you do the scanning or and you do the manual impression and then you do the CAD softwares and, and CAD design in-house. Then you manufacture the parts, so you print it, wash it, cure it, and then uh, you produce a final appliance or polishing to deliver the treatment. However, another option is also, for example, saying, uh, okay, I just do the scanning or taking the normal impression, I'll still continue to, for example, outsource uh, my work to a dental lab or a design service or whatever option is suitable for you uh, in order to do the, uh, let's say, design of specific appliance. For example, it can be a surgical guide, indirect bonding tray, among others. So what can happen there is, for example, if you just sort of source the design, then get back the file and you produce it in-house. So this is uh, another, uh, one option of you still have uh, control of the production step and then deliver the treatment. Or another option that we can also see is that people, for example, want to see the benefits of 3D printing and have their dental lab produce the appliance uh, and then get it back. So again, there are different formulas and even this formula or combination of the workflows can vary per application. So maybe you will start printing models and still source, for example, the design of surgical guides or occlusal splints and then trans you start to transition some of those in-house. So there's uh, even this workflow can vary per, per those applications. So a little bit of answering our first questions, why go digital? So there are main, uh, three main reason, uh, reasons to go digital. And one, it's again, uh, understanding the complete digital workflow. It's a high quality and precision that we can achieve for this workflow. So as we mentioned before, less amount of steps is less probability of introducing errors uh, to, throughout the, that whole cycle. And this is very important. Then the precision of intraoral scanners are comparable or better than uh, poly, uh, polyvinyl siloxane impressions, for example. Uh, of course, we can discuss depending on the application, but uh, technology is getting much more sophisticated today. And also that 3D printed models um, are even more precise than plaster models. You can see some evidence in, uh, published out there about backing up this, uh, let's say, this process. But also, it's easy to reproduce. We're not dependent on one single working model. We knew that in the traditional workflow, if we had one model and if it broke or something happened, we needed to call back again the patient to register the case. And that actually uh, adds more workload to our side. We need to uh, book a, the, a new slot. The patient needs to come in. And overall, we know that, for example, intraoral scanning is much more pleasant, uh, let's say, process for the patient as a whole. So another important thing is that why higher quality and precision? Today, for example, with digital technologies, we, we are able to combine even CBCT with intraoral scans 
to produce, for example, a surgical guide. So we have a complete digital patient that we know exactly where all the uh, noble anatomical elements run. We can design our guide precisely and integrate all these technologies together to assert also to the extent that we can incorporate digital, uh, digital photography into this to do, for example, a facially driven uh, rehabilitation design. So it's a very exciting time to, let's say, incorporate all these technologies and there's no excuse to get a high quality patient. So the next reason of why go digital is because of efficiency. And we saw this, there are significant time and cost savings. And I think that at this stage is pretty obvious after what we presented in this webinar. This amount of steps is also not only less prone to error, but also faster workflows, shorter delivery times, and less amount of appointments. It also, uh, intraoral scanning reduces chair time and instant feedback. So we know exactly if our impression was correctly or if we need to retake it, aside, of course, improving the patient experience. Also, the CAD design, we can decide whether to do it in-house or at source. Today, with the digital transmission, it is much faster. We just are an email away from communicating with the dental lab technician and ask for feedback. So we don't need to do any sort of uh, physical exchange of models. Today, it's just a matter of connecting and sending an email to get, uh, let's say, instant input from whoever we need uh, recommendations or, or, or feedback. And also about 3D printing, produce parts in-house to reduce costs, also deliver appliances that are even more precise or even uh, same day. We know that 3D printing and doing some uh, uh, workflows in-house actually has a lot of benefit because we can sort of reduce some uh, fee costs and also for uh, reduce some, uh, let's say, uh, cost for the patients and also it opens the possibilities of same day delivery of appliances. Of course, we have seen this with milling that the possibilities of delivering, let's say some same day restorations, but also printing, for example, today, if you can deliver a bleaching tray in a ma much faster, uh, let's say, and shorter time frame, it's actually very nice for the patient experience and productivity. So a little bit about intraoral scanning. We this is just an example, uh, courtesy of like uh, of, of three shape of comparing the analog versus the digital one. Of course, again, practice makes perfection. So at the first time, it might take longer than what we see in this video, but still, uh, it's not only uh, very productive. We know that for patients that have very sort of acute gag reflex, um, this is going to be. Uh, a life-changing experience for them. So uh, it's intraoral scanning, it's here to stay and will get much more sophisticated throughout the time. So just to compare, for example, in this animation, we see that the lower and upper, uh, like how the digital workflow is actually much, uh, let's say faster than the traditional one. So there's, I think, no excuse. And if you have an intraoral scanner, then it is a natural step that you uh, want to, let's say, start to produce appliances in-house. So a little bit about same day delivery times and productivity, just to let you know with this material that we're printing right now, uh, you can print models, for example, in 28 minutes and including the washing and curing and the fabrication under one hour, you can have an appliance ready to go for the patient. So before maybe we were not able to offer this, but today with digital technologies, and with new patient demands too, we're able to sort of have uh, under the sleeve options uh, in specific cases to run the extra mile for those patients. So reason number three, it's better patient experience and outcomes. I believe that uh, this is, again, pretty obvious with the integration of all the digital data. We have better diagnostics and treatment planning, seeing all these anatomical elements that we can sort of identify of uh, seeing the bone quality, see how that incorporates with intraoral scanning. We know that uh, this precision is as it's best with all this technology int integration. So of course it facilitates the communication because we can also show the patient, for example, what is happening or what we need to be careful or any sort of consideration patients uh, are able to visualize much clearly today with uh, technology, uh, what are they undergoing and uh, some treatments available, or for example, a smile simulation. So this is uh, actually uh, new options that we didn't have to do the traditional workflow. Also, it's shorter and less um, appointments and increases patient satisfaction. We believe that that is evident and this is backed up by research. And this is my next point because as professionals and technology is great, but we always need to back up ourselves in research because we practice an evidence-based dentistry in our profession. So just to let you know, there's a lot published out there, a lot, whether it is traditional versus digital workflow, milling versus printing, 
or printing technology versus another printing technology. So there are endless possibilities and it's very interesting to see uh, what are sort, some sort of results. And let me share with you a couple of examples. For example, this uh, research study uh, published uh, in 2017 talks about how the use of fab in-house fabric fabricated sterilitographic implant surgical guides uh, show similar accuracy to laboratory or fa fa manufacturer prepared guides. So this is a, it stated that te a, a technique that it's very convenient and cost effective that will assure proper implant placement. Moreover, also, for example, using the, the incorporation of, of CT guided dental implant surgery, this has improved clinical experience and evidence-based superior outcome. Another example, for, for, for instance, a crown produced via the digital additive workflow, uh, comparing the cement cap, for example, for a crown that was fabricated conventionally or versus uh, subtractive technology, and they analyzed the cement gap and the additive manufacturing showed uh, a smaller cement gap, mean cement gap, compared to the other technologies. Uh, for example, this is more approach to maxillofacial surgery. It helps to reduce operating room costs secondary to shortening procedure times. So uh, maxillofacial surgery and healthcare in general with the uh, anatomical models and being able to prepare themselves for surgery has actually enhanced a lot the process. And for example, comparing uh, dentures printed SLA versus DLP uh, related to the, the, the trueness in that case uh, and with different build angles. So here for, is a clear example of different 3D printing technologies being compared um, uh, like DLP and SLA. And for example, this is a very interesting research study that's uh, about the introduction of digital dent denture technology in a university clinic in North America and about using 3D printing for preliminary steps resulted in substantial cost savings, fewer visit, increased patient satisfaction, but also satisfaction from the students and the faculty members. So we're starting to see this even shift in within universities and dental schools, which is also very exciting and that new generations are already trained in this technology. And last but not least is also that, uh, for example, the production of models, how it impacts, for example, uh, the digital impressions compared of traditional versus PBS. And actually, uh, they both replicate the tissues, uh, let's say, uh, with a high accuracy. So there are no significant differences. But one last thing that I wanted to finalize is that we see that there are a lot of uh, areas of dentistry that are having a benefit. But one thing that uh, we know that this was published in 2018, that what needs for a research is the new materials available and 3D printed technology is evolving at a, such a fast pace that um, we're going to be seeing more and more evolution and production of dental materials that are going to be uh, also biocompatible that will allow us to print more and more applications directly. So uh, this is very exciting and also a, call, uh, a nice call to action that uh, this is the future of 3D printing lies in the, in the evolution and R&D of dental materials. So additive and subtracting manufacturing, just to let you know, and we know that we are all familiarized with subtractive technologies and additive technologies, uh, let's say, uh, are something new. And just to let you know, with subtracting manufacturing, we are referring, for example, to the milling process in this case and 3D printing uh, to a different technology. We can consider the both as like 3D printing, but one is removing material and the other process is adding material. So about additive and subtractive, we know that these technologies are actually complementary. So we know that subtractive manufacturing has more, for example, for milling machines have more materials available, they have very high precision, but the limitation that they have is the geometry limitations and that not all geometries are, let's say, reproducible. They have to, you have to have the specific parameter of milling radius compensation activated, and also that the cost per part is higher than printing. On the other hand, for printing, we know that we don't have limitations on geometry. Mostly everything is printable in, with this uh, additive process. They, you, we have a very high precision and it's getting better and better each time. Of course, there's a limitation of materials available and what we can do today, but R&D is developing very fast and we're just seeing the beginning of what it's possible. And also it reduces the cost per part. So a little bit, what does the printing process layer by layer mean? Uh, this actually, as you see, we have the same object on the left and on the right hand side. But the difference that we see here is that the layers that are producing this object are different. So on one hand on the left, uh, we see that these layers are taller and on the right hand that they're smaller. 
And this actually, it is important because the printing time and surface finish will affect this. So for example, if we print with taller layers, we will get an object much faster, but maybe we're going to be seeing the transition of those little layers in a little bit more visible. But if we print uh, an object with, let's say, smaller layers and having, um, let's say, uh, more accuracy or like more nicer surface finish. For example, for a restorative model, we need to be the layer super uh, small because we need to have a super, super smooth surface. Then uh, uh, in that case, the, it, we're going to get a very nice surface finish, but the print time is going to be increased. So different materials have different layer height settings. So based on your needs, you can also decide uh, for example, if I want a model to print fast, I'll probably go with the option of taller layers. And if I need an object or a model that I need to, for example, very high accuracy as a restorative model, I will go with the option of smaller layers. So this is how it looks in a prat practical world. We see the same object printed in 100 microns versus 200 microns. That is sort of the reference and other metrics that we use to define the heights of these layers. And we can see that the one on the right hand side, we see more the, let's say, the stepping in that sense compared to the left hand side. But another important thing within additive manufacturing is understanding what is SLA technology. So SLA technology, it's a family within 3D printing and additive manufacturing. If we see with additive manufacturing, we know that we have different families. And uh, we have bad polymerization, we have powder bed fusion, material extrusion, material jetting. And these are all new concepts for us. But the ones that are mostly used also for, for let's say, dental 3D printing is the family on the left, which is bad polymerization. They're all fundamentally the same. What varies there, for example, DLP versus SLA? Uh, so we, let's get to what is the same. We know that we're going to have a liquid resin that is going to be cured layer by layer. Now, the difference lies in how that, res that layer is being cured. So for example, if we compare DLP versus SLA or low force ster sterilitography, it's actually in the DLP side, we're going to have a layer being projected all at the same time. And that, uh, that is going to be in the projection of, uh, let's say, a pixel in that sense. But on the right-hand side with low force stereolithography and SLA printing, we're going to have a laser that is going to be curing uh, spot by spot. So advantages and disadvantages. On the left-hand side, this process is going to be much faster to print with DLP. However, for the surface accuracy, low, uh, low force stereolithography, having this laser that cures spot by spot would really translate in a higher, uh, let's say, accuracy and surface uh, resolution. But again, this is constantly evolving and we're seeing a lot of improvements in, let's say, uh, the settings and print speed in all technologies, and, but mostly uh, also evolution of what materials are compatible and what, how, what we need to print if it needs to be super accurate. I always go with, let's say, SLA technology. So again, these are, let's say, different options we do within the VAT polymerization family. So what is SLA? Because there are uh, SLA technology as we just described, but what is LFS, low force sterilitography? So uh, low force sterilitography is a technology within SLA family that actually what it does, it's as you see here, it has uh, uh, the resin tank, which is seen a little bit in light blue. As you see, there's going, it is a little bit flexible. So it's a little bit bended, right? And you are, you, every time that it's being cured in that part where the light processing unit is under the tank, it's a little bit flexible. So we see that the laser is curing uh, that spot. And how does this translate? And I'm going to come to this concept of, for example, having two glass uh, panels and we're going to be interposing glycerin. And if we try to separate those, we know that we're going to have a very high force. So how do I reduce those forces? Because this is exactly the same effect if I want to separate these two objects that happens in the printer every time the build platform wants to separate from the liquid resin. So how do we reduce those forces and why we need to reduce those forces? Because if every time we are separating the build platform from the liquid resin, there's a risk that the object is detached from the build platform. So in order to reduce those forces, what Formlabs did was to develop this technology of having a flexible tank, as you see here, and also having a laser that it's always being perpendicular to the object being cured. So having a flexible tank allows us to make the object separate much uh, gently from the liquid resin. 
and having the laser that is also going to be exposing every time the object perpendicular is going to have a very, very clean curing. It's going to be a very clean uh, laser that's going to have a very nice, let's say, precision and uniformity. So this is the essence of low force lithography. But how does this translate into clinical relevance or clinical life? So light touch supports actually, it's the answer. So if we are able to separate, the object is able to separate in a much gentle way from that liquid resin, that means that I can sort of uh, play around with how strong I need to adhere it to the platform. So you see here on the left-hand side, a denture base. So you see that it has a, some little sticks that are called the support structures. And you see that here we're removing it with the hand. That means that these little sticks, we can make it a much smaller, so afterwards, when I have my printed part, I can remove them much easily. So this is a very nice option in that sense that it's going to reduce a lot what we call the, the delivery times or post-processing times because I'm wasting less time removing these supports. And this uh, impacts our practice because we need to define how much time each process takes for us to deliver a final appliance and removing supports is not something to be underestimated. So how to implement this workflow and get started? So just to let you know, there are three big steps that I like to refer to getting started. For those of you that are not using printing, my first suggestion is pick uh, and start with an application, which is the easiest or your most inefficient and unreliable or expensive application to date. So what can this be? Uh, and the application should be the easiest. So what we usually define as the easiest is models, model production, and that we're still using it a lot. So my recommendation will be start with something simple of models. The, because this is a very nice application that you don't need basically CAD software if you just want to produce a model that, for example, it's going to be for bleaching trays or study models. No, uh, do not include in this category any, let's say, models for clear aligners because for that stage, you will need a CAD software that uh, this application is also very important that your team can adopt and that it's very easy to use. So uh, models is a great start because it's a very straightforward process. And again, it's very important to get the buy-in from the team because when we're taking the digital step, it's not only us clinicians maybe taking the decision, we're also going to need the collaboration of all the dental staff to deliver, uh, let's say, uh, in a timely manner. So. Just to tell you an example of, for example, how easy it is to produce a model and uh, using uh, this feature of Preform that's called Scan to Model. So we know that the CAD part can be a barrier for adoption and people think that if you don't do CAD, you cannot do printing, which is a misconception. Um, but we know that CAD can be a barrier for adoption because it has steep learning curves, some fees associated. That can be a challenge for clinicians that are new to the workflow. So with scan to model usually what you're doing, it's eliminating that step where you need to sort of use any CAD software other than preform that it's the nesting software to prepare a part to print. So with uh, this new this feature of, of, of scan to model, you can eliminate completely that step and you can uh, base your models directly from your internal scan. So what is the process? So uh, maybe you have an intro scanner and you can do this process, but maybe you don't. Uh, so first thing first, when you get, for example, your intro scanner, your patient case, you need to you scan your patient and you need to export the file that you get as an STL or OBJ file from your scanner. Then the next step that you need to do is open the software preform, uh, which you can download already for free and, and give this a try. So you experience yourself how easy uh, it is to use. You import the file. Then what is going to happen is there is going to be um, a pop-up that's going to show you what material and what layer height you're going to choose. And for example, here I selected a printer, I selected draft resin, and I'm going to print into 100 microns because for a bleaching tray, it's more than fine that it's a model printed into 100 microns. The appliance will fit perfectly and for a bleaching tray is more than enough uh, resolution that I need. So once I select those three variables, uh, there's going, I'm going to press this truth icon in the software and I'm going to be importing the file. And there's a wizard that's going to be popping up. So when I press the truth icon, I press import 
I'm going to import my, um, let's say my file here, it's an STL file, and here the software will upload it. And what I need to do next, the, it's give it an orientation per the wizard. In this case, I'm going to orient the crucial surface, let's say parallel to the build platform. So the build platform is this grid that you see here. So it's going to be where the object is going to be constructed. And I wanted to give an orientation. So I know that it's pretty much parallel to that build platform. And okay, I check it from all the sides. I see that it's pretty much, let's say parallel. Okay, perfect. I see, then I press next. And here I need to, okay, where I want to cut, what is the data that I don't need from this scan? So this stream plane, I check, okay, I'm not cutting any relevant information. Excellent, so perfect, looks fine. I can erase anything that is from that, let's say, uh, light blue part. Uh, down and then what I want to do is to add an extra base because I wanted to give it like a little bit more uh, let's say uh, base below that uh, blue trimming plane then I put create and here what the software will do it's going to be editing the model so the software will be cutting uh, the plane and it's going to be uh, adding the extra base model that in this case was three millimeters so uh, we're going to let the software run and of course, if you have a lot of, like, if you have a very, let's say, good computer, this is going to run much, much faster. Uh, if you have something running in the back, of course, you can take a little bit longer. Again, this is just standard, um, uh, let's say, a process of any computer and when you're using uh, this kind of, let's, let's say, 3D softwares. And here you can see that I have my, okay, perfect, I have my model. And this is a solid model, which means that it's going to be completely filled. So I check it from the sides. Okay, it's looking perfect, and I press done. Excellent, so now I see my object, it's perfectly created, and am I ready to print? And here I, for example, calculate uh, on the right-hand side how much time it will take to print. So I let the software, let's say, run and tell me, okay, how much time in this resin and resolution will take me to print? And in that case, I see that it's 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm ready to print. So the next uh, also that I like to do with this software is that you can add and use the same, uh, let's say, feature to add a chamfer to the back of your models. And this is nice if you want to sort of facilitate the removal from that platform, because you're going to have the object directly on that platform. And if you add a chamfer, it's much easier to pop it out of the build platform. So now I'm going to go to this uh, part. So once we have the file, we are consented directly to the printer and it's going to start printing. So what is what models can I produce with this feature? So these are models that are going to be used for core applications. So these are applications that don't require treatment to be done in any CAD software. So I just need the anatomy of the patients that it is in order to produce my appliance or to use as a study model. So um, it is going to be very useful to get, let's say, started with the printing workflow and benefiting from having your scanner, but still not being overwhelmed with, let's say, um, involved in any sort of CAD software if you're not ready. So what is like core applications? So you can print diagnostic models, which are super useful for case presentation to patients or models for physical analysis and manual manipulation. This is very much loved by orthodontists and still used. And, and this is something that you can use this feature for. So you don't need any sort of CAD software other than what we used in preform. You can also print models for thermoforming appliances or try in models. So for thermoforming appliances, we're talking about bleaching trays or retainers. So this is good for same day delivery of treatments with a first aligner. If we are, let's say, want our patient to start getting a feel of what it is to have an appliance constantly in their mouth while we produce our first aligner, maybe want to produce a retainer because our patient lost it. You want to produce a bleaching tray or to really, let's say, reproduce broken appliances if that happened. So it really turns around delivery times and is very nice for patient engagement. So because we are able to deliver much faster, let's say, treatments uh, with these little core, core applications. Then we have trying models. So the clinical advantages lie in that we, if we get an uh, occlusional splint or a holy retainer or any other appliance, you can still print models to check the fit. So even if yourself, you start to print splints in, in your in office, uh, you can still print a model and check the fit before the patient comes. So if you start like to see how it works, how it's a fit, you can still do this uh, and produce a model from the intro scan to check the fit if you are checking some facts before delivery. 
Last but not least, this is also models for manual wax up. So this is a very nice hybrid workflow. So I have, for example, been trained in doing manual wax ups. I really enjoy that process. And I know that using CAD software, I have been trained in some CAD softwares and it's a little bit, let's say, a uh, different way of reasoning this. And what I like to do is printing the model of a case and doing manual wax ups because it's allowed me to have maybe more than one model, test different anatomies or tooth proportions. And I, upon that model, I could, uh, let's say, um, produce a silicon index that I will use that to do the mock-up in the patient's mouth. So this is a very nice way of, uh, let's say, combining and doing a hybrid workflow that will allow me to produce multiple wax-up models uh, and not tied to one only. So it's very easy to reproduce and it's a good way to slowly start into the digital workflow and then transition to, a, yes, a CAD software eventually. So step two is define and test the workflow. So it is very important for us to, although we're going to delegate a lot of steps, we need to understand the workflow. We need to acknowledge the different steps and what is required for each one of these. We need to communicate why the workflow is important for the practice and the patient to the team. We need to identify our key players in dental staff and delegate them the specific tasks and get our team on board and train them. We need to train them and you will see that they will become the experts in the digital workflow. But start with one, one workflow. Test it and define it, how it's going to work. Start with only one. That's a very good way. Instant. Don't think that you are going to start doing everything from one day to another. It's more getting one application, uh, let's say, uh, nail that application and then yes, transition to what would be a scaling up or other applications. So. The next step would be start small and scale up. So models for core applications are a very nice, let's say, as we just presented, a good way to start. And that will be my highest recommendation for you. And um, again, models are still uh, a very important clinical tool. So I would say that uh, it's very important for us to uh, also know this workflow and benefit from it. The next step would be to transition to occlusal splints and surgical guides. We know that we have even in, uh, learned to produce some uh, occlusal splints completely clinically and in going to CAT software, if we want to, let's say, uh, produce this ourselves or design it ourselves, it's a very nice way of learning like to design this application uh, or even surgical guides because we are the ones deciding where the implant is going to be placed. And if we do that analysis ourselves, we are understanding much more how the end use appliance would look like. So these are very two nice applications that a clinician can completely, let's say, design for themselves, but also you can still outsource it. The only thing important to note here is that these two resins compared to application one, they're biocompatible resins. So this means that they will come in contact with the patient's tissue. So the management here, it's super important to have a separate, let's say, washing station, not wash the same resins that are for model production with biocompatible ones and uh, keep a complete separate, uh, let's say, you can use the same printer, but have a build platform or resin tank dedicated to each one of these materials. And it's very important to follow exactly the washing and curing times because manufacturers test mechanical properties and biocompatibility based on those specific instructions for use. So it's very important to comply with these. And next uh, step, let's say, if you're transitioning from beginner to intermediate to more expert, you can start printing provisionals, permanent restorations, and even dentures. But these have a little bit sort of a different steps in what we call their finishing process, post-processing protocol, because for example, these resins of permanent and temporary for temporary restorations require a sandblasting stage and to use two steps of curing the appliance. So it's a little bit different compared to the other materials. So it's good that you first test uh, basic applications and then you start to understand how, let's say, other materials that have a little bit more of steps works. So this is my suggestion of the recipe, how to get started. So just to, as a recap, okay, I want to start. How do I produce a model for a retainer for same day delivery? Express a uh, view. Okay, I scan my patient and print and deliver. I scan my patient. I have a perfect, I have like this render that it says we see a hollow, uh, let's say, uh, file. I'm going to import it uh, in preform. So I import the file. I do a scan to model and add a base. Excellent, I have my model. And then I print. In this case, I'm going to be using draft resin because it prints super fast and accurate models. So 
we can print in two resolutions and it's I can deliver the appliance in one hour, one hour and, and 15 minutes. And the surface accuracy is excellent because I read all the instructions and I know that this is going to be suitable for my application. And then I'm going to be printing and as we are going to be seeing now, and then we're going to wash and cure the part. So for washing, we need to wash in a bath, in this case, using the form washed. It's an automatic station. You set the time and you can wash it in a basket or directly in the platform in IPA 90% or higher concentration. In this case, the washing time for this material is 10 minutes. We allow it to dry, excellent. So I wash my part, I remove the liquid resin, and then I cure the parts. So here I remove the parts from that built platform and I'm going to be placing them in the cure. So in this case, I will cure this resin for five minutes at no temperature. These two variables are, you can configure it in this curing station that is the form cure. So it will uh, allow me to achieve the final mechanical properties. So then excellent, I have my model. I'm going to be doing the thermoforming of the appliance. I use my standard procedure, so my thermoforming machine, my thermoforming sheets, my dental hand beads and uh, cutting tools and polishers. So I get my appliance. I'm going to be doing the initial cut. I'm going to smooth the edges. I'm going to polish and I'm going to deliver the appliance. So all of these can be combined in, let's say, deliver the appliance in one hour to the patient. And this is how, uh, let's say, a retainer that was thermoformed upon a model into printed into 100 microns looks like. So we can see that the aesthetics is actually very high. You can see a little bit the layer lines passing to the retainer. Uh, in the more, if we look at the incisal edges, but this is again a macro picture and the aesthetic outcome, it's uh, let's say very pleasing. So this is how a lateral picture looks like and perfect, I produce my appliance. So just to some like uh, round up a little bit, uh, because one thing that is important to acknowledge is that practice management is super important. And because we think, where shall I place a printer? How shall I prepare my space for printing? So what is important to acknowledge is that what is the space set up? So we know that the printers today are sort of our desktop size. We can place them basically anywhere. Uh, there are a lot of clinicians that I know that are placing it in the, in the waiting room because they like it to be a discussion point for the patient or within, let's say, uh, where they have the dental chair. But uh, what we would suggest or like, what is my recommendation is that you have everything in the same place with, so you can change very easily between materials. So my first recommendation is get a solid table with no movement. We're dealing with printer's gears and you see that printers have uh, little foots. And of course, if the printer is tilted with uh, unbalanced or you move the table, you're printing an object. So that is going to be transforming from a liquid to a solid object. So you need to have a table that it's going to be stable. Then you're going to, my suggestion would be to orient the objects or let that your the workflow from left to right. So the CAD station, the printer, wash, cure, and post-processing, uh, let's say, area. So uh, above, we can have case workflow and organization. So we know what's coming in and what's coming out. So we have everything that's being printed on the same, let's say, area. So we have our CAD station in this, in this uh, let's say, on the left side of the printer. We have the 3D printing area, and then we have the post-processing area. Why is this useful? Because if we're not managing this ourselves, or we have several dental staff that are sort of going to be doing this for, our, for, for us, we need to, it's very easy if we place it in, in this specific order from left to right. There's, it's going to avoid uh, any sort of problems or um, making any mistakes. So following the process, if the part is printed, okay, we know that we need to wash it. And if what I come into the lab in within my practice and see that the wash uh, is ended, that means that I need to cure it. So I can follow exactly the step. And if uh, you have like a sh different shifts for your dental staff, whoever is coming in later and knows which step is ready, they can continue uh, whatever where, wherever their colleagues left off. Then we have uh, on the bottom the resin tanks and uh, cartridges like we saw today, these boxes and uh, let's say cartridges with liquid resin. And we have, for example, IPA, gloves or other elements that we will use for finalizer parts. And a little bit how much space it can take. It's not that much, but it's nice to have a dedicated area uh, that it's a well-ventilated room that you can sort of, uh, let's say, uh, have a space dedicated to that away from la direct light just to avoid, let's say, curing of the resins. Uh, that's super important. So uh, it's going to be, let's say, not taking that much space. And last but not least, the staff and digital are prerequisites. You need to get buying of your team. So any steps 
from a practice, practice management perspective, it's super important that it's a team conversation. That technical skills or willingness is a must. Everyone can learn. We have seen that setting up the printer is very easy and that today we are using very much sophisticated uh, technical tools or digital resources uh, in our private lives. This is going to be very easy to adopt by anyone on the team. So of course, having a dental technician is ideal with digital experience, but we can still identify any other key players that are willing to learn and scale their skills to become the experts and then train others. You will see that they will ramp up in no time and going to become even the masters even more than ourselves. So as a conclusion and to round up, what to consider to go digital? That we digital workflows are flexible workflows. So we are free to decide what is most convenient for us, what to take in-house and what to outsource. That the learning curve is for the professional and the team, that there is a learning curve, but that there are some, are some strategies to start, for example, printing models that can sort of eliminate that learning curve. Then you need to evaluate your ROI. You need to acknowledge what new skills you will need to acquire yourself and your staff. You need to do a practice structure of your time, your space, your team, estimate how much time it will take me to produce an appliance in order to schedule my patient for the next appointment. We need to analyze what are the resources needed and um, also consider that we will be providing an excellent patient experience. And this is always a North Star. What is the best for our patients? And how to go digital? Choose your starting application. Choose to what to take in-house and what to outsource. Get your team on board. Acquire the pertinent resources. Get trained and plan to expand to new applications as your skills grow uh, together with your team. So I just want to say uh, thank you. And just before we uh, wrap up, I just wanted to show you a little bit how the printed part uh, ended up looking. So what I would do is I'll stop sharing my screen in one second. And just to show you what the end uh, appliance looks like. So I'm going to be wearing gloves again. So again, wearing my gloves. Excellent. So how my printed part looks like. What I will be doing is I'll open the cover. I always like to do this trick because we have liquid resin. And I'm going to be closing the cover. And this is how my object looks like right out of the printer. So we have the model, and you see that it has still liquid resin. This is normal because it just pre finished printing. So next step will be to wash it in the form wash. So in this case, I can sort of place it in the form wash. Uh, the form wash opens automatically. It has a basket where I can remove the object and wash it in the basket or place it directly in the form wash and then put start. So that's one part. And then once I wash the part and let it cure, sorry, and let it dry, then I can proceed to curing. And it's very important to remove it from the build platform. So how will, uh, let's say, a part look like in the end? So I had the exact same model here printed. So you can have a look. And this is how the end model looks like. So as you see, it's very straightforward and easy to do. And uh, I think that this is a nice way to start, uh, let's say, getting yourself into the digital workflow with 3D printing uh, in a very, let's say, easy way for you and your team to, let's say, become confident with this. So we did this live. It happened during this webinar. So I believe that there's nothing to be scared about. So now coming back and just like the final remarks and to thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you to again to the Henry Schein team. And thank you to all of you that connected today. I hope that this is sort of words of encouragement to uh, start going digital. It's a fascinating time for us to be, let's say, alive for the profession. So I encourage you to not be scared and take the digital steps. And I also want to wish you um, a good evening to everyone. And of course, I leave my contact details in case you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer. So I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Praderi, for the great presentation. And of course, thank you to Formlabs for sponsoring tonight's webinar. We did record the webinar this evening, and everyone will receive that recording via email within one week of tonight. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. Webinars at henryshine.com. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.